you find a church like Bay, it makes you feel at home. It makes you feel like you have another family. We always talked about, you know, serving and helping and always wanted to do it and just never did. But uh, with my work, I'm a firefighter. We have 10 guys that I work with. You know, we work 24 hours worth away from our family for 24 hours. It kind of started with my wife and I starting a fusion group at our home. But I also said, okay, well, you know, I work a third of my life with these guys at, at work. If I could bring us uh, this material, you know, it would make it so much easier for us to get together and talk about Christ and, and get the word in our lives at work. I've uh, never liked to stand up in front of a group and, and speak, uh, but the way Bay Community has helped with the, the fusion material, giving me that, it just, it, it helped. Finding the church is the easy part. You know, anybody can come in and sit down and, and go through that those steps. We did it for five years. The hardest part is stepping in and just giving it a shot. The guys I work with, none of them go to Bay, but it's not about that. It's about bringing Christ um, in a community. And it's not just Bay community. It's not just my town. It's, it's our jobs. It's our, it's our families. It's everybody. And I feel that that's what Bay's about. And it's, it's family and it's home. And, I, and if we can spread that in any way, if it's whether a fusion group or getting out and serving or whatever, um, I feel that's important. My name is Chip Hendricks and I love my church. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Jerry Taylor and I love my church. Anybody else? Hey, listen, we're so glad you're with us. Malvis Campus, Mobile Campus. And listen, we need a special little uh, concern and prayer for our Foley Campus. This is the third weekend Foley Campus has been operating and the AC is out and they're sitting in a hot box about 80 degrees. Can we all give them a big hand clap of appreciation? Foley. I started to say, maybe you ought to just take your shirts off, guys, but don't do that. Wait till after service, then go down to the beach, jump in, do the plunge. You deserve it. Thank you so much for enduring this. Uh, we were meeting at the middle school in Foley, so some of that's out of our hands until, you know, we get back into the system and see what's going on. But thank you so much for your faithfulness. Well, this weekend, we're going to begin a series. We're going to talk about the family of God for the next month. And uh, if you have your device or you want to look, you can go to Romans 8 and go to uh, Acts chapter 2. Those two texts will pull up. Uh, I, 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 wanna, I really want to talk about our, our church, our, the church. Uh, and I know this, most of you who grew up in church, everybody has church stories. And for the most part, I hear a lot of the horror church stories. I mean, it, it's really bad. It, it really could do a reality show on all of the, all the misfit church stories that have been out there. So I, I want us to spend some time uh, for the next month uh, during the summer and talk about our church and why we love our church. You know, our culture, the Western cultures in general, now this is talking about America and Canada and Western Europe, uh, we have this individualism that's different than much of the rest of the world. We've had this for hundreds if not thousands of years. Here, here's what this individualism does. It, it elevates the pursuit of individual gratification above the welfare and well-being of family. It's no wonder today that 4% of the people in all of our Western societies, those I just listed, one out of 25, is a sociopath. Now, now here's what that means. That means they actually have no conscience at all. One out of 25 in our culture has no conscience at all. At all. The first personality disorder recognized by the, the, uh, the Association of Psychiatry was uh, guiltlessness or sociopathy and it occurs at a much higher rate in our culture than any other culture where family values are stronger Japan and China their family values are stronger it occurs less from 1976 to 1991 uh, they did a 15 year study of the prevalence of antisocial personality disorder it doubled during that study 
they found that it's a hundred times more common than colon cancer. It's four times more common than schizophrenia. And, and, and so, you know, I really would like for you to help me look around the room and identify these people. Um, you know, you just count on the rows of 25, get a little box and say, okay, help me. No, I'm kidding. Uh, we as pastors here, you know, we meet and with, with a lot of people. We help people. We give spiritual advice. And, and as pastors, we see this kind of stuff. We really do. We, we see where people have done great harm to others, and, and they don't really care. There's no remorse at all. And, and without the slightest, you know, sign of guilt or remorse. So today, 1 in 25 who live among us, here's what the, the bottom line it means. They, they can do anything at all. They can do anything at all. Now, this is not a new problem because Paul, the Apostle Paul, he described these people. In 2 Timothy, he said it like this. He said, there will be terrible times in the last days because people will be lovers of themselves. One of the big debates in our country is over gun control. But there's not a lot of attention being given to the fact that one out of 25 people in our society doesn't have a conscience. So when you take a look at some people who have committed gun crimes and those crimes get our attention, you can clearly see that these are people who are in, either in love with themselves, consume with self, or have no feelings for other people, have no conscience. And to me, that's really what we need to be focusing our attention on, and that's just my opinion. I don't give my opinion very often, but that's my opinion. God has an answer to this destructive uh, emphasis on, of individual gratification in our society, and it's called family. It's called family. God chose you to be part of his family. That family is the way we overcome this individualism piece, this gratific self-gratification. This is how we beat these challenges. We hold each other in family. You hold each other accountable, and in family, you bring people together in family for the good, for better, for better things. The operation of family begins spiritually with your relationship with your heavenly father. Jesus said, let your light so shine that men may see your good works and praise your Father in heaven. Now, Jesus said, made that statement in his first public sermon. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. You can read it. Actually, it's your homework, Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7. When he began this, here's, here's what he's trying to say to these people who are sitting on this mountainside overlooking the Sea of Galilee. He, he's, having it, he's saying, listen, we can have an impact on people by doing good things for people by being considerate, by being sensitive, by loving people. And that shows the love of the Father. If you read the Sermon on the Mount, which I know you will for your homework, if you underline or mark the term Father, your Father, our Father, you will see that it appears 17 times in one sermon. And, and that's big. Because in the Old Testament, this reference to a spiritual father is, is only discussed a couple times. When it gets to the New Testament, the book of Matthew, it, it explodes. And especially in this one sermon, the first sermon, there's, there's 17 times. So one of the things that we know in studying scriptures, that there are spiritual rules of interpretation that help you get an understanding on how a passage was meant to be interpreted. It, uh, scripture has three layers to it, and a lot of people will read the first layer, the black ink on white paper, and they just try to interpret from that. But there's so many uh, levels and depths of interpretation, and one of those that's critical to understanding Scripture is what is called the value of numbers. So this number 17 is very important number in Scripture. It, it, it's always identified with people who are selected and chosen to be part of God's family. In other words, it's like God has a stamp on a certain group of people. So G for Jesus to say 17 times, our father, your father, our father, he's saying that God's calling you into family, but it begins by your relationship with him. 17 is an incredibly important number. I'll give you another example of this, and you, you know this verse. You've read it. You've heard it. But I want you to look. It's, it's there in this verse. It's Romans 8, chapter, uh, verse 35. He, he, I'm going to show you 17 things that cannot separate us from the love of God. Paul's writing, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword? Those are just seven that he lists that cannot separate us from the love of Christ. He goes on down in verse 37, and he says, And all these things were more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death, eight, life, nine, angels, ten, nor demons, eleven, neither the present, twelve, nor the future, thirteen, nor any powers, fourteen, neither height, fifteen, depth, sixteen, anything else in all of creation, seventeen, will be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
So biblically, 17 is always associated by being chosen by God. So Jesus uses this term, 17, and, and if, if, if the Jewish people sitting there, those who knew, they, they, and they're hearing the term over and over again, if they had counted, they would know that what he's talking about. He's talking about being called in the family. Now, let, let me go into, let's just look at the number 17. Because 17 is the sum of 10 plus 7. In Scripture, the number 10 is the number of order. In our culture, it's, we count by tens. We, we base our decimal system on the number 10 because it repeats itself and it's easier to count by. You know, you ever counted by 11s or 13s? It's, it's a little harder. So in Scripture, the number 7 is the number of spiritual perfection. People say, well, it's the number of perfection. No, it's the number of spiritual perfection, and that is associated with the Holy Spirit and the things God's given us. He's given us seven days a week, and on and on and on. You go through all of that. So when you take 7 plus plus uh, 10, you get 17. It's a very important spiritual number because it was a perfect number. You think, well, I, I don't see how 17 can be a perfect number. Well, you cannot divide 17 by any other number and come up with an equal number because it's a prime number. I'll give you another il illustration of this in the Scripture. Jesus, uh, he, after he's died on the cross, he's resurrected, he meets with his disciples in Jerusalem, and, 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 and he's, he's resurrected, and these guys are going back to the Sea of Galilee. Some of them are still wondering if they're going to follow him as the disciple, and so they go back to the sea, and Jesus said, I'll meet you there. So when he gets there, he, 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 you know, they're out fishing in a boat, he's on the shore, and, and the King James says that Jesus yells this out, okay? And of course, this is King Jimmy, you know, his, his language, children, have you any meat yet? Uh, Okay, that, that's not what you would say in South Alabama. You'd say, hey, boys, you caught anything yet? So Jesus yells out, hey, boys, have you caught anything yet? And they said no. And Jesus said, throw your net on the other side of the boat. Now, some of these guys are professional fishermen. Throw your net on the other side of the boat. The Bible says they caught 153 fish. Now, immediately, because Scripture mentions 153, Bible scholars for years and years and years have been searching out what does that mean? Well, 153 is a number that's associated with a term in the Old Testament that appears seven times in the Old Testament. And that term, I'll, I'll tell you the Hebrew word in a minute, but the, term, the Hebrew word, it means this, the sons of God. Now, you would think that term would be in, in Old Testament more, but it's seven times. Understand that in the Hebrew language, in the Hebrew letters, each letter has a number that it's associated with. Like in, our, in ours, A would be 1, B would be 2, and on and on and on. Well, in the Hebrew, their letters have a number. So you, you can take any word, and it's also a series of numbers, and you add them up, and you come up with a total, and numbers in the Scriptures have significance. So the phrase, Benai Elohim, it is, means the Son of God in that equaled when you add all that up in the hebrew it's 153 so they caught 153 fish which is symbolic of catching the sons of god now here's where 17 comes in because 17 is a factor of 153 now I'll, i'm gonna tie all this together all this has to do with family and belonging and the selection of being chosen by god so I, I'm going to, in just a moment, I'm going to put something on the screen because if I don't do this, you're going to take your device out and you're going to go to calculator and you're going to be so distracted in the rest of the service trying to add this up if you're a numbers freak, okay? Because you're going to see this. So here, here's what I'm going to, I'm going to show you this, how this works, okay? And, and, and seeing that this number, this 17 is a factor of 153 and how, how it all adds up. If you take the first and second number of our numeric system, number one and two, you say one plus two equals three. You take that total and add it to the next number, which is 3, you get 6. Add it to the next number, which is 4, and 6, you get 10. You add it to the next number, which is 5, and you add it to 10, you get 15. Then you take 15, add it to the next number, 6, you get 21. And you go all the way through this and look at 17. 17 plus 136, you get 153. And I know you're thinking, well, Pastor, how'd you figure all that out? Trust me, I didn't. <laughs> I read a commentary, <laughs> okay? And I'm giving it to you from the commentary. I'm sharing this with you so that you can see how this is God's mind, and his mind is unbelievably detailed. He puts all this stuff in, and all the depths, and all the layers, a layer upon layer, and all of these numbers have significance. He puts a number to a letter in the Hebrew. It's all significant. And what you see is you're seeing God say, I have called people into family. I have factored people into being family. Jesus said he's called us into family. Now, we, you know, the way we overcome this individualism of today is we become part of God's family. And then we learn the values of his family. 
then we understand that what is going on, God has developed us to be part of family. When God told Abraham, he said, hey, listen, I'm going to use you and your family to bless the, the, the families of this earth, Genesis 12. He didn't say that I'm going to use individuals. I'm going to do, use the long rangers. No, he said, I'm going to bless families. I'm in the business of blessing families, and that's what he wants to do. Now, some of you in the back of your mind, you're thinking, yeah, but my family has been a mess. You don't know the hurt in my family. You don't know the dysfunction from my family. But, but and, and even my family, they, they don't like me going to church or they don't like me going to this church or whatever. I, I understand that, but I have to say that God wants to bless your family. And I want you to see that you can overcome the past family experience. It may not happen the first month of you being a Christian or the first year, but just keep walking with God because he'll change it. God wants you to see that his family, he will use his family to change your family. Now, I've made this statement. It's no new statement, but you've heard it before. The church is, as on, is only as strong as the family. The nation is only as strong as the church. So, so goes the church, so goes the nation, so goes the family, so goes the church. But here's the part that just, just hit me this week in, in, in putting this together is, yes, the, the, the church is only as strong as the family, but God's family he uses to change our family. And my mindset is, oh, I got to get my family right. I got to get this right. Got to get it all perfect. You can't do that on your own. But when you get into God's family, his church, his church and his church family, that's what helps your family become healthy and become strong because he wants to use his family to help your family. And when he does that, here, here's what family can't argue with. They can't argue with the evidence of what's going on in your life, the changes in your life. They see the way you, you conduct yourself. They see the way you, you handle your marriage and your children. They see all of these things going on. They can't argue with this evidence. And so that's why God has raised up the local church is to help you become part of the local family. But watch, we are adopted into God's family. Now, in the Western mindset, the word adoption, we immediately go to the negative side of this and say, well, yeah, I'm adopted because nobody wanted me. No, someone adopted you someone chose you someone picked you and and so the focus shouldn't be on who did not want you it should be on who took you in in the rome in the roman times especially during the new testament in rome if you adopted a kid during that time you could never disinherit a child if you adopted them now your own kids you, if, they, if they messed up, you, you, you could kick them out and out of the wheel, take them out. You're not getting the house. You're not getting the boat. You're not getting nothing. You know, we're, you're out of here. A kid you adopted, you could never disinherit adopted child. You had to give them an inheritance. The Bible says we've been adopted into God's family. He chose us. So the guy who didn't choose us and doesn't want us, we're glad he doesn't want us, and we're glad that God chose us because the guy who didn't want us is the enemy. And so then we decided, oh, we're going to become part of God's family, and it's okay that we're adopted into his family because he will not disinherit us. We're part of his family. We're, 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 we get to have the benefits of Christ and the Son. He's, he, you know, he's, he's our brother, and he's, he's our Lord and our Savior. We're part of this family. The very name of God that he chose to reveal himself to us says he wants us to be part of family. Let me show you what I mean. In the scripture, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. Here's what Paul said. For this reason, I kneel before the Father. It's written in the Greek. It's the word pater. Pater. I, I kneel before the pater. And from, e from whom every family, the word family is pateria, which comes from pater, in heaven on earth derives its name. In the English, it doesn't make any sense because the word father and the word family have no connection. But the word family comes from a Greek word, familius, and it is the name of a low slave in a household. It's, it's the lowest slave in a household. So that's where the name family comes from, but literally in the Greek New Testament as it's written, the name father and the name family are the same word. They belong together. They're connected. They're root words. They belong together. Here's what that means to us today. God could have said, oh, I want you in my family, but don't call me father. Call me creator. Call me almighty. No, no, he, he, he didn't do that. And it doesn't mean he, he's not creator and almighty God. It means that when we relate to him, he's saying this, call me father. Call, call me Abba. Call me pater. Call, call me dad. 
That, that's what he's saying. So for Jesus to come to these people and on his first sermon and say, Our Father, 17 times, here's what he's saying to the people. He wants to have a relationship with you, the Father, and he wants to be your spiritual dad. He wants to pull you into his family. He doesn't want there to be a distance between us. He wants you to trust him and come close. God ordered everything in creation and families, the animals, the, 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 the trees, the rocks, all of this stuff. You're part of a family, and you've been called into his family, which is the church. So watch, the local church on earth is now the family of God. And when you go to the local church, you should experience family like never before. But you hear all of these dysfunctional stories. You hear all of this stuff that's out there. The Bible says that the earliest part of the church was like a family reunion. It's like, oh, I hadn't seen you in a week. It's so good to see you. And you, you're relating and you're connecting. The first sermon of the church talks about the family, Jesus, his sermon. The, church, the birthday of the church, Peter, he talks about the family on the day of Pentecost. He gets up and preaches. Watch how this family of church, the new church that's birth, watch how it reacts. Watch all of these. See if you pick up some things in Acts 2.42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the Word of God, to fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily as they were being saved. Do you know why the church grew? The church grew because families grow. Your family grows. Families grow. And listen, troubled families grow. Dysfunctional families grow. You, you, you probably have heard of this guy uh, in, in our history, Genghis Kong. He, he was a ruthless guy who, who came from Mongolia, and he conquered part of Asia and China, even ended up near the Middle East. And, 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 and they, they tell us today that they estimate that today there are over 16 million people in China that have the genes or the DNA that directly tra trace back to Genghis Kong. Bad families even grow. But here's what I want you to know. Healthy families grow even more. And that's what happened in the church. The church was really healthy, and they, they were doing healthy things. Here's what they were receiving the message, the word. They were applying it. They, they kept coming to church, listening to the word, and, and using it in their lives. They kept walking it out. It wasn't just information for their head. It was put in their hearts. They stayed around fellowship. They developed friends and relationships. They, got, they, 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 had, they, they had small groups. They got involved with this and that, doing all these things, and, and, and they loved to eat. I have said, if I had the ability to build a church that you could build it where all the, it, it, it was full of tables and chairs and you had a full kitchen and every service you filled a full meal, you would run a million people in a month. We love to eat, right? And so it's the fellowship, you know, it's meeting somebody new, getting them to, to take you over to Cracker Barrel and, and buy your meal. You know, it's just, it's just taking down the barriers. We love to eat. And they kept coming back for prayer. Two of those things were natural. Two of those things were spiritual. That's what made the church attractive, and people wanted to be part of it. Why? Because all the elements of family were there. Watch this. After that, we just read it, generosity begins to flow. We're one big family. It's just like a few months ago when we did our first Fight the Hunger project with the organization Fight the Hunger. We, we, we were going to do 50,000 meals. You, everybody was going to buy them. You came in and boxed them. We went 100,000 like that to feed children in, in Haiti. You guys just jumped in on that. That's generosity. That's how the church is supposed to work. Then it can make an impact. The local church, now watch, here's where I'm going with this. The local church has in it something people are looking for in family. Here's what people are looking for in family. It's called the spirit of fatherhood. We live in a society where there are a lot of fatherless children. People are looking for the spirit of father. They don't know it, but they're built that way. Uh, here's what a father does. A father gives to his children the sense of justice. You, you see, you and I live in a world where there is no justice. Well, maybe there's a little bit. <laughs> there's a little bit out there. But for the most part, people out there are doing things wrong all the time, and a lot of them are getting away with it. See, here's what we crave. We crave a, fam we play we crave a family. We crave a place of security where we can come knowing there's going to be justice. And that's what the Father does. He says, hey, listen, I'm not able to fix the whole world situation right now, but when you come into my family, I, I, I can promise you you're going to have justice. And that's what the Father does. The Father upholds things. He holds them up. The, the Father nourishes. He strengthens his children. He encourages. That's the Spirit of God in the church to encourage people. 
The love of the Father is to protect and to protect his people and, and to protect the innocent. And, and, and see, you, you don't need to go out of your way to protect the guilty. Here's what we're doing in our society. We're almost going out of our way to protect the, the guilty. That's not what he says. Protect the innocent. Protect the children. Protect the innocents. Take my word and believe what my word says and don't water it down and start protecting the guilty. The word says, and in love we protect what the word says. In love we, we share the love of God. But no, I'm, I'm going to protect the innocent and I'm, I'm not going to protect the guilty. See, fathers, uh, it, you know, it, it's, it's father-like wisdom protects us from the sociopaths in our society. If one in 25 has no conscience, sooner or later you're going to work with one. Sooner or later you're going to be in church with one. Sooner or later you're going to live by one. Sooner or later you're going to be around people like this. And so what do we need? We, we as the church, we need to receive wisdom to God, from God to know how to do this and not get hurt by these people and then not offend these people but be, be an example to these people. Perfect example is the story of Solomon. Solomon's going to become the king, and he cries out to God. He said, I, I'm like a child. I don't know what to do. I've never been king. My dad was king. I don't know how to be the king. And God said, what do you want? I'll give you anything you want. He said, I want wisdom. He gave him wisdom. He gave him fame. He gave him money. It's not long. He has the first encounter, the first major problem. Two prostitutes come before the king. You know the stories, probably. E each had new babies. The babies were three days apart. And, and, and these prostitutes lived in one big room. You know, there's a whole group of them. They live in one big room. And, and one night, one uh, rolled over on her baby and smothered her baby. She wakes up, and craftily, she takes the dead baby over to the other lady's baby who's three days older. She takes the living baby in her arms, puts the dead baby there, and goes back. And the next morning when the lady wakes up with the, the dead baby, she looks, she panics, but then she looks at the baby because, you know, mamas know their babies, right? And so she says, oh, no, this is not my baby. It looks down to the other end of the room, sees the lady with her baby. Well, what is she going to do? How is she going to prove it? There's no DNA. There's no testing. There's none of that. So they go before the king. They go before Solomon. Remember, he's prayed for wisdom from God, and God even gives tender care wisdom for prostitutes, okay? And, and so he, here's what he does. He says, bring me the baby. They bring the baby. He says, now get me a sword. And he says, take the sword and cut the baby in half, and each of you take a half. The woman who was the sociopath, the, the, the woman who was self-gratification, she was okay with that. Makes no sense at all. She was okay with that. The other lady, oh, no, 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 no. She can have my baby. She was the real mother. Solomon said, give her the baby. You, you, you see, that's what church is about, receiving wisdom from God. God didn't run out of wisdom after Solomon. He gave us a book that's full of 66 books, and they're full of solutions and answers to any problem we face in our world, in our culture, in our time, and, and things that you and I can learn how to deal with, with difficult things that come up in life. There's Scripture, there's Word, there's insight in there to help us with that. So we're called together not just to hang out, but called us together to get smarter and more effective in walking out our lives and to learn how to be more helpful to the world that we live in. Now, as a pastor, when, when, when I planted this church 16 years ago, I wanted to create a healthy church. I want the healthiest church possible. I grew up in church that was dysfunctional and not healthy, okay? <clears throat> but that, that was my heart. <clears throat> so let me give you some examples of what makes a healthy church. <clears throat> in our church, I, I, wanted the, I, want, I wanted the best praise and worship possible. A and if not, then I want to fix it. The worship in our church is better now than it's ever been, and let me tell you why. And I know it's not the style that some of you grew up in, and I understand that, but I want to tell you something. This is the best worship I've seen in Bay Community's history, and, and here's why. It's because of the participation and energy and worship that you're in. It, it's, it's not a concert stage. It's, it, we're, we're leading you, and so we're seeing more and more people learn l l worship and, and move into the place of God. And so we, we, we've never had participation and energy in worship like this until now. And, and, and I want to say I, I love what, what Luke and Brian and Scotty and Jordan, these guys, what they're doing. It's incredible what's going on, the worship in our church. I'll give you another thing in our church that needs to be healthy, and that's children's ministry. We, we need a great kids' ministry. It's amazing what kids learn in, in our children's church, in our, in our ministries, about the Word and worship. They kind of do what we do in here. It's just on a different scale. They have fun, and they have more faith than we do because they're young and innocent, and we get old and mature, we have less faith. I don't know why it works that way, but those little guys, they've got faith, they love God, they worship God. And, and here's what we do with our kids. We, we, you know, we label our kids for their security. 
You know, you go in, you, you, you scan in, you check in, the food allergies are there, it indicates that. There's cameras in every room in the hallways, there's security people everywhere. You know, we, we, have, a, we have a policeman on duty here every weekend, and, and, and you walk up, you sign in, you get two labels, one for you, one for the kid, and you can't pick up your kid without that label. That's security, that's protection. And, 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 and here's why, because I'm going to protect the innocent. I'm going to protect the innocent. And there's a lot of churches who are not protecting the innocent. And so the guilty come along. I was a children's pastor 20 years. And I realized from a friend of mine who said it, and I thought, wow, he is so, so true. You know, if there's a person out there who, who, who is mixed up in, in things they shouldn't be mixed up with children, if they wanted an open door somewhere, go to a church. Because in a church, oh, yeah, go serve here. Oh, yeah, go serve there. No, we do background checks. I mean, we're serious about this. Hey, but, but let me tell you what's coming up. You, you, you know we're, we're finished. By the end of the year, we'll be in our new facility. Then we're going to renovate this facility. This will become Children's World, and all these things are going to change. But let me tell you what's coming up. We're, I'm, I'm working on a plan that when you come into the commons with your baby, there'll be some of those plastic chutes like at the drive-up at the bank. <laughs> and you, you put your baby in there and hit the button. <laughs> there it goes. Here's what's holding up that production. I'm trying to come up with a sensor system so if there's a dirty diaper, it diverts it to another place, takes the diaper off, cleans the diaper, pats it with a little powder, and sends them on in fresh so baby workers don't have to change diapers anymore. <laughs> Nursery workers, right? <laughs> See, we, we think about all these things, listen, to better serve you. Every aspect of our worship service, every aspect, lighting, sound, everything is the better. Why? We're wanting you to learn how to, no distractions, to get into a place to worship God. With your children, we want you to feel safe and secure so you can come in here and worship so they receive the word at their level and, 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 and they're, they're learning at their level how to worship and learn the word of God. So we want you comfortable with that, all of that. But, here, but listen, whether we intend to or not, here's what happens in our mindset in this Western world. We begin to create this attitude of consumerism. Even in the church. And that's where I'm choosing my church, kind of like I choose my grocery store or I choose where I shop. And if not careful, we've been to sh we begin to shop around, church shop, and, 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 and church becomes less about what it's supposed to be. It becomes about making a consumer choice. And let me tell you, if you do that, that's a mistake. It's a mistake. We need to be rooted in church, and there are things that we need to understand about church. It's different than just being a consumer. We're here to serve, and, and we, we, we want you to understand that, that you pick your church because of that. Now, here's how I'm going to end this, and I'm finished. Three questions you need to ask yourself. And you answer to yourself. Don't, don't answer to me, but answer to yourself. Here's the first question. Am I receiving, about your church, three questions about your church you need to ask yourself. Am I receiving instruction that exposes weaknesses in my ways of thinking and also provides me with solutions so I can become more like Jesus Christ? Listen, I know I'm not like Jesus. I'm still, there's a lot of room for improvement. And I, and I realize that. And so it's an ongoing process. You never reach that point. Listen to me. Those of you who have been Christians forever, you, you, you never get there. We never become like Jesus. We never become perfect on this, on this earth. And, and so going to church, you continually grow. You continually learn. You learn how to live for Christ more effectively, and you learn how to love people and serve people. Second question you need to ask yourself, am I connecting with people in relationships that enable us to encourage each other and hold ourselves accountable? Listen, it's great for you to come to church and sit in rows, but what's just as effective is for you to go to someone's house and sit in a circle. Something happens in a small group with like-minded people. You begin to share your faith, your life stories. You begin to talk about it. And what happens in that position, you, 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 you get to a place where you become accountable to each other. You hear their stories and how they overcome this and that. And you just become accountable to each other. And that means you hear things that you need to work on. And, and, and the Bible says, as an iron sharpens iron, so does a man that the countenance of his, friend, of the countenance of his friends. This fall, we'll start back our small group. We have a summer small group growing on. This fall, we'll have to start back with a new series. I encourage you to be part of that. It makes our family healthier. Here's the third question. Is my commitment so weak that a minor disagreement is grounds for walking away? I, I've seen families uh, over the years leave our church, and, and they've been here for years, received from God for years, yet they left the church over some little issue, or they left of the church over no issue. And, here, and here's what's happening you know, if this is a pattern, you get into things, you get feelings, and you imagine things, anger starts to drive you. I've seen people do this in marriages, jump marriages. I've seen people do this in their jobs, jump jobs, 14 jobs in two years, you know, all over the place. Here's what happens. When you get mad at, at a relationship or place, and you walk out, and you go to the next thing, sometimes you realize, I really had it better over there where I was. 
But the reason you have a hard time going back is because you said so many negative things and words against those people or that place that you have really and truly, you have, you, you've been shoveling and slinging like rocks and dirts and it's piled up. And so in order for you to go back, you'd have to climb over the hill of your pride that you built. And most people won't do it. That's why we have church hoppers. And, and, and listen, in our next class that you've heard about, uh, it'll be this week, it's once a month. Here's what we do. It's about being partners partners in our ministry here you'll hear us we've been doing this for six or seven years teaching on how to leave a church yeah but we're just coming in no we want you to know how to leave and because you see there is a spiritual principle that most people don't know how you leave is how you're going to enter how you leave is how you're going to enter if you leave bitter and angered and offensive in the next relationship marriage job you're going you're going to repeat the process I cringe when I hear people come into Bay and they start saying things about that old church or that dumb old church or this or that or that pastor. I don't engage with that. I will not engage with that. It's totally inappropriate. I won't even respond to it. But here's what I'm thinking in my mind. Yeah, and you think we're great right now, but it's just a matter of time. You're going to feel the same way about us because it's a cycle. It's a cycle. So you need to learn how to exit and make changes. You want to do it right. Most people don't do it right. And here's what I, that, and that's another reason the church in general is unhealthy because you need to be rooted in the house. Does that mean that God can't put you somewhere else? No, God can put you somewhere else, but there's a process in that. And that's what we teach in, in, our, in our next class. And it's not spontaneous, it's not anger, it's not mad, it's not something I didn't like or this or that and the other, because you're going to repeat that if, that if that's the pattern. And that's what we want you to do. Jesus even on the earth in his days here he knew that he couldn't get what he wanted he understood this self-gratification because on the day that he was going to the cross he, he 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 struggled a little bit and then he finally said okay lord father not my will but your will and he knew that if he would do this that what was going to happen is he said i'm doing this because i'm doing my part because this is going to make a family I'm going to be able to take care of the sins of the world, but I'm going to help a lot of people. My death is going to help a lot of people come into the family of God. And sometimes, listen, sometimes the gratification of the individual parents needs to be pushed aside so the welfare of the family is made possible. The welfare of the family is more important than the individual gratification. In the, in the natural family and in the spiritual family. So let me share this. I'm going to pray for you. I, I believe that in the years that we've learned, and we're still learning how to be a healthy church. And listen, we're healthy, but we're not perfect. There is no such thing as a perfect church because they're not perfect people, okay? So th that's not it, but it's healthy. Doing family together, doing life together, and growing together. When, when, I, was, when I was in the, in fact, this, this, just, this revelation came to me yesterday afternoon. In fact, I was sitting right, standing right over there during worship when this revelation came. And it was like uh, this number 17, and I'm wanting a healthy church. God said, you realize in January, this church goes into its 17th year of existence. So here's what the Lord spoke in my heart. He said, in that, in that season, you are going to see growth not, 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 I'm not looking out here. I'm looking in here. You are going to see internal growth in the families of this church that is going to be so radical that people are going to look and see this as a healthy place to get their family in so that the church can help their family become healthy. That's for this house. I want to pray for our family, our church. Father, thank you for the Bay Community Church. Thank you for birthing this in my heart. Thank you for building and creating it. But Lord, we want to recognize that if we were the only church on the face of the earth, it would still be your church and would be where your family meets. So Lord, as we come in to worship you, as we come in to bring our children and let them be ministered to, let, let us understand that this needs to be a healthy place so that we take back to our homes so that our marriages and our raising our children, our finances, all these things become healthy because of the church that you created. Thank you for the church. And I thank you, Lord, that you heart our church. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.